Hey guys, uh, this is Abwikta. Welcome to the Wrath of the the Whispers, the Whispers of the Old God card review for the arena. I always call it Wrath of the Old Gods. It uh, just sounds like a better name. Anyway, uh, yesterday we discussed all the neutral cards where I think the meta is going, the big picture, um, and now here is the the rest of the analysis, and we're going to go through the class cards that have been revealed so far, starting with uh, the um, starting with the forbidden card mechanic, which is uh, the new mechanic. I love this design, by the way. Is the uh, the forbidden cards. And the Forbidden cards, Blizzard, by the way, has announced that there won't be one of these for each class, but we've seen three of them, and there may be more. And the Forbidden cards use the following mechanic. Spend, it's a zero mana spell. They're all zero mana epic spells for each class. And it's all spend all of your mana, and then do something that's based on the mana that you spend. So you can spend all of your mana in the late game. Or, even in the late game, you can spend some of your mana to do something on the turn and then spend more of your mana afterwards um, in order to finish it up. Very flexible. Um, we'll just use Forbidden Shaping to kind of set the stage, but generally what it is in terms of tempo is that it's always bad for your tempo. You're, you're never quite getting the bang for your buck. But if you were going to float one mana anyway, so if... You did something and you're going to use this card and it costs you three mana, but you would have played a two mana spell otherwise. Then it's worth it. So that's the math that goes in. It, it's really interesting. Um, so Forbidden Shaping is a priest card where it says spend all your mana, summon a random minion that costs that much. So if you spend four mana, you get a four mana minion, which can at best... Uh, I mean, okay, sure, it could be like a Hungry Dragon, but generally, uh, at best, it's going to be like a 4-5 or a 5-4, and much more likely, it can also be a 4-4, or like something total crap, totally crappy that uses a battle cry to get its value, right? Like uh, a Dragonling Mechanic or a Gnomish Inventor or something, right? So it's not very good value for 4 mana. You never want to like play it on curve necessarily, but if you play it where you would have played a 3-drop, now we're more in line, right? Now even the misses are are kind of three drop ish, and the hits are, are just absolutely amazing. So this always allows you to curve out at any point, just not so well. So like at five mana, playing a four mana card, that's pretty good, right? So playing a random five mana card, that's okay. Six mana, playing a random five mana card, uh, playing a random six mana card, that's okay. If you're playing this on turn two. It's a little shaky, right? Uh, but hey, it's always better than not curving out. So it's this interesting card where now it's it, it kind of fills every gap in your curve, but not very well. Um, anyway, super interesting card. Um, and, and of course, if you're wondering about the value, right? Like how good is this card? Uh, think of Dark Peddler. Dark Peddler is a super underwhelming two drop and it is really highly rated. And I don't mean it's just highly rated because you can get like power overwhelmings and soul fire or whatever. It's also just really highly over uh, highly rated um, because you can get another one drop out of it, which then turns the dark peddler into also a three drop. So it's both a two drop and a three drop. It's not a great two drop, and it don't, it's not a great three drop either. But it kind of gets the job done, and therefore that flexibility gives dark peddler immense value. Right? It's like one of the best warlock cards now. Forbidden Shaping is the same thing, only it affects all the drops. And in the very late game, you can get a 10 mana minion. And you can get an 8 mana minion. Like, it solves the problem of having to put large minions in your deck. It's a free large minion if you top deck it, or you just don't get a chance to use it before then. But it's also flexible on your curve. So, like... It's easy to look at this and not have any real idea of what to do with it. And you know, you don't like RNG. I don't like RNG. Um, so it's it, it's easy to dismiss it. But this is not just a good card. This is a great card. This is a elite card. This is a card that you will almost always take. Like maybe sh uh, Cabal Shadow Priest over this card, right? Maybe. That's the level of goodness this card is. And not because on any particular play it's that strong. It's because on every single possible play. It's strong-ish. And, uh, and that just lets you do other things. 
Um, so that's uh, Forbidden Shaping. Mage also gets a Forbidden card, Forbidden Flame, uh, which is spend all of your mana, deal that much damage to a minion. Again, three mana for three damage, not great. Uh, two mana for two damage, definitely not great. All the mage spells are better. But you get to deal however many damage you want, and it's a hard removal if you want it to be. So that ridiculous flexibility, again, makes this one of the best cards in the, in the game. Uh, super, super elite card. And I know I'm going to get a, a lot of pushback on this, uh, but I think these are truly, truly elite cards, uh, despite the fact that they will never be mana efficient. Like, imagine top decking this or like getting it later on in the game. Well, now you have a large drop or a tempo card, right? If you have it in the early game, sometimes you just really need to deal two damage to something. It's just super flexible. Like, are you missing a, a four drop? Or, or like your opponent plays a Yeti and it's your turn five and you don't have a good five drop for the Yeti? Just like, kill it. Um, just flexible in every situation. It's like a get out of jail free card. Uh, and then of course, Paladin also has one of these cards. It's called Forbidden Healing. Spend all your mana, heal that amount, uh, heal twice that amount of health. Uh, so again, it's not that good um, in terms of the ratio, right? You normally spend one mana uh, for a, a flash heal and it heals five it'll heal two here you spent two mana for holy light which is a paladin card you heal six you heal four here um healing touch nature healing whatever the druid card is is three mana eight three mana would only heal six here so you, you, you see the idea right you don't heal that much but again it can heal 10 it can heal 10 uh sorry 20 health if you use all your mana on it late in the game uh that's more than any of those cards and at any point you can throw as many mana as you want in order to heal a minion on the board and then keep it alive. That's incredibly useful, right? Like, as a backup to a also just heal your face and completely end the game for your opponent who's like relying on it, uh, who's relying on face damage kind of card. Uh, again, it's, it's, always, it's not that good, right? It's still a heal card and heal cards suck in the arena. But as far as heal cards go, it's the best heal card, um, like the other forbidden cards. And uh, this ties me in to, uh, to something else I really want to talk about, which is class balance. So one thing we worry about is where the arena meta is actually going to go once all the cards come out. The other thing we worry about is how is this going to affect the class balance. I wrote an article, or I updated my uh, class tier list uh, last week for uh, LOE for League of Explorers. Uh, it was really late. I'm going to make the next one like a month after release of... Uh, of uh, old gods um but the the order that i have the classes are in is uh mage and rogue on top then paladin then druid then warrior and warlock then shaman and hunter and finally at the bottom is priest that's our current order that's pretty much the order it was in tgt uh warrior aside warrior made a huge jump um shaman kind of fell a little but generally that's kind of the order uh, that it was in in TGT, and you go, even go back to GVG, it didn't change that much. Like, your mage, rogue, and paladins were always on top. Um, your druid was always in the middle, warlock was in the middle by then. Um, BRM did bring warlock up on the on the back of, uh, of Imp Gang Boss alone, but that change aside, like, just not much moves. But as Blizzard has shown in the warrior design of LOE, it doesn't have to be that way, right? If Blizzard wants to, they can just push cards out, push mechanics out to raise a class, sink a class. They can do all sorts of things. And they can do it with very few cards. They just have to be really, really good cards, and they get the offering bonus of being in the new expansion. So I'm looking at class balance. I'm going to try to see what's going to happen with the class balance. And unfortunately, um, we don't have any common class cards yet except two. Um, if TGT is any indication, we're going to get at least three common class cards of each class, but right now we literally have two. Now, the two we do have, though, I think sends a very strong message that even though I think in general uh, Old Gods is not an arena expansion, it's a constructed focus expansion, it's an expansion that comes with standard um, being the new format and wild being split off and a lot of the old cards rotated out and so they're focused on making sure the old cards kind of stay in in some form and they're worried about balance and they should this is like a huge change to Hearthstone and it was something that had to happen sooner or later so I fully understand why this expansion is not arena focused but even there like I like what I see here right we were talking about forbidden healing as a paladin card 
Yeah, it's an epic. You weren't going to see it that much any, uh, anyway. But it's a crappy card. And Paladins need more crappy cards. I, I don't know how else to, to put it. Paladins just have too many powerful cards. It has a good hero power, and then the, the cards are just, like, ridiculous. The cards are, like, priest-level ridiculous. And the hero power is one of the best hero powers, as opposed to one of the more shaky hero powers. Um, priest hero power being, like, a warrior hero power if you don't have a board. So, what the Paladin really needs in this expansion is more crappy cards. Especially more crappy common cards. And Blizzard didn't quite get the memo um, last time around. Or, they had to make a hard choice, right? So, Keeper of Oldemon in League of Explorers was a common. And everyone's like, why aren't you a rare? And that's because uh, anything can happen had to be the rare. Because obviously anything can happen shouldn't be a common. That would just be a ridiculous common card to have. Uh, but yeah, but that kind of upset the balance a little more, right? Like Paladin was got a lot of good cards in TGT, got a lot of Inspire mechanics that uses its wonderful hero power. Um, you know, things like Mooklas even that are especially well synergized with Paladin. Um, but here we see a balance. It's coming back, right? Stand Against Darkness is the common card for the Paladin. And it is a 5 mana card that says summon 5 one, one Silverhand Recruits. So yeah, it's 5 mana for 5, 5 worth of stats. Um, that seems okay, right? Like, that's like a tiger. Except it's not. Like, this is clearly a combo card. It's clearly meant to be played with, like, Quartermasters or, like, Direwolf Alphas or Raid Leaders or Stormwind Champions. And it's totally possible to hit on those combos. But as a standalone card, this is not good. A tiger can trade into a minion and survive and trade into a larger minion, right? So you kill like a 2-4 and then you kill like another 5-5 five five or a 4-5 or whatever. These 1-1s one just all die. It is good at establishing a board, right? So that you can almost be guaranteed to be able to buff something the next turn unless your opponent has a board clear. And if your opponent has a board clear, letting the, your opponent trade a board clear with a crappy card, one card, and board clears usually get more than one card, uh, that's a pretty good deal for you. Uh, so generally, it's a way to set up a board so that you can buff it with something and then get ahead on the board. If you're really ahead on the board, this is even like worse because you can only have two minions on the board and use this. Uh, otherwise, you, have, you don't have room on the board for this stuff. So it comes out to be this really awkward card that kind of serves a purpose and that it lets the Paladin get on the board, uh, which the Paladin kind of needs some way of doing. That's not Keeper of Oldemon, bad Keeper of Oldemon. Um, and this is a very Paladin-y thing, right? Make a lot of dudes. Um, so I like the card design, but it's also like purposefully not powerful. It's purposefully combo-y. It's purposefully, well, I'm going to trade a lot of tempo for a setup. Um, and that's good. Paladins need cards like this because it is not good. And Paladins have been getting way too easy of a pass on all these expansions for the last couple of them. Shield and mini bot, like cog hammer, muster from. Anyway, um, so Stand Against Darkness, one of my favorite cards so far that have been released. And on the other side of the coin, the only other class common. Remember, these are class commons with a plus offering rate. You're going to see them a lot. And the other one is Nazoth's First Mate, which is a warrior card. And we all know warriors need help. They're fine now. We're, we're, we rated them fifth on the class tier list for LOE. Um, but, but the offering bonuses for LOE are, is going away, right? So less, uh, less uh, monkeys and less obsidian destroyers. And that's going to have an effect, uh, like a very large effect on the warrior, actually, because those are the big cards that are bringing it back. So Blizzard can't quite you know, take their foot off the pedal on the rehabilitate warrior in the arena process. Uh, I mean, even if they did and they just made okay cards for the warrior that kind of kept pace with other classes, warrior would still not be, like, horribly behind the way it was in uh, in TGT. But Blizzard made Nazoth's first mate, which is quite possibly the best card the warrior has. I'm going to still give the edge to Arathi Weaponsmith, and Fiery War Axe because they actually ensure a two for one trade or almost ensure a two for one trade. Uh, whereas this questionably can get you a two for one even if you play it on turn one. And then later on, obviously the one through weapon kind of gets in the way. Um, but it's still an insanely great card on turn one and still a useful utility card on later turns. And it's a pirate. Warriors has some pirate synergies on top of that. 
Um, and it's a tempo card, and warriors need tempo. And it's a ping card, and warriors need pings. It just kind of fits in so much of, a, of the warriors' needs. And uh, with all the dilution going on of the original card pool, and the fact that warriors haven't gotten a real weapon since uh, since Nax with uh, Death's Bite, a uh, common weapon, I mean. Uh, no Ogre Warmall doesn't count. Uh, Nazatha's first mate, one mana, one one, giving a one three weapon as a battle cry. It, it just fits so well. And it's going to be so good for the warrior. And it's going to make such a big difference. Um, and so again, Blizzard keeping the warrior up, keeping the warrior up, and pushing the paladin down a little. Um, that's very good. And, and you may wonder why I care so much about pushing the paladin down. Like, isn't Rogue and Mage better according to my tier list? Class tier list? Yeah, it, it is. But, but they're way harder to play than paladin. Like, I remember in the classic days when everyone was like, oh, mage, no-brainer, playing fine. Uh, paladin had a little more nuance back then, and, and it was also just less good. So mage was just, like, overpowered. And even then, rogue was still, like, questionably better in the hands of the best players. But, more importantly, paladins now, even though you see them everywhere... They're, they're mostly played by lesser players. And I don't mean, like, only bad players play Paladin. I mean, bad players have a much better chance of getting far with Paladins because they rely on, like, a large card pool of good cards. And they're rather simple to play. Play minions, buff them, win. Um, whereas Mage requires a bit more control play style, or, or at least the option to go control play style, which is a little more difficult. And uh, Rogue involves, like, managing face damage and, like, thinking five turns ahead on turn one. So you want the Paladin to kind of come back to Earth so that people aren't auto-picking Paladin and being like, hey, I do really well with Paladin uh, sometimes, and I don't with other classes. Anyway, class balance. Blizzard doing an excellent job so far with the card reveals. They can go ahead and screw it all over because we only have two common cards out of whatever three times nine is. But that is a very small percentage. Um, but so far, very good. Hey, this is Adwikta from the future. And I'm coming at you because we have delayed the release of the whole video series. And so one more day has passed and two more class cards were revealed. Um, and I wanted to get it in here. And I didn't see a good, elegant way of, of doing it. So we're just going to jam this section in here. Um, but, but you'll like it because it's, it's just more content. And we have two really good cards that I wanted to talk about, which is why I really wanted to get this out instead of like waiting a week or whatever for the next video. Uh, the first card is a common. It is a druid common. And this is going to fit into this theme like super nicely of uh, that we were talking about before, uh, about just how flavorful cards are being added to the arena that also makes classes kind of balanced. And it is the Mark of Yesharge. Uh, that's not the right pronunciation, I don't know what is, but it's a two mana buff for the Druid, common class card, plus two plus two is the buff for two mana. And if it is a beast, draw a card. So, you know, Mark of the Wild gives plus two plus two and taunt. This one doesn't have a taunt, but you can buff any minion still. So it's just as flexible as Mark of the, um, as Mark of the Wild. And on top of that, if you are uh, buffing a beast, you draw a card. So beast synergy, great. Blizzard's been making beast druid uh, happen for a while now. And uh, you know me, I, I, like, I like beasts. Um, and especially more synergy for beasts makes everything more powerful, right? You add one synergy to beasts, now all the beasts on the board become more powerful, and all the other synergies that synergize with beasts become more viable because you're even more incentivized now to pick beasts. With this card, it's kind of like, are, do hunters use beasts more or do druids use beasts more? It's kind of, it's a little shaky now. I think they're about even now with, uh, with all the new druid cards that have been coming out, which is cool um, in terms of flavor. And more than that, it's a powerful card. I don't know how powerful people think this card um, is, uh, because 2 mana plus 2 plus 2, it doesn't seem so good. Mark of the Wild is not the best card. But the fact that you can draw a card out of it if it is a beast, and you're going to have, what, like 4 beasts uh, in a deck? Average, or maybe minimum. Maybe you'll want 6 with, uh, with uh, this new card coming out. It's a common card, and... Normally, you want to use these kind of buff cards with a minion already on the board and kind of use it to attack into another minion and then have your minion survive. But you don't even have to do that with this card. So often, this card will just be used as, I have a beast in my hand, and it's going to now be a bigger card in the late game, and I'll still get a card back. 
Whereas in the early game, you have the flexibility to be able to use that plus two plus two to not draw a card and still get on um, get on uh, get onto the board and to really expand on your board. So. It has all of the upsides, except for the taunt, which is not a huge deal, of Mark of the Wild, with a ridiculously large upside in the late game to turn this two mana worth of like tempo and card advantage card into a, on average, probably four mana card while still getting it, which means instead of two mana, it's a six mana in terms of size on average. And um, you can do that as long as you have any beast available for you to buff. So. It's it's a really uh, I mean I wouldn't say it's like a premium class card for Druid, but it's a very good card, and and it fits the theme very well. And Druids are good. We rank them fourth, but um, still nice to see them uh, get good cards. I also like that it's a buff card because Druids haven't gotten all that many buffs uh, lately. It's gotten Wild Waker, uh, which is nice, uh, or Wild Walker. I can never get the two uh, figured out. But anyway, that's nice. Uh, but again, it's it's also for the beasts. And this is going to be another pure buff card. It's like a seal of champs for the paladin. So ultimately, you want more classes uh, that have the kind of buffing mentality. And Druid is the buffing class that also has a ping, right? That's why it's balanced. That's why it's flexible. You can go with the defensive hero power kind of style that a mage would play. Um, or you can go with the buffing kind of style that a Paladin, for example, may play. There's also Token Druid, which is a thing for the, the very reason that um, there are all these buffs for the Druid. And so it's good to see Blizzard working on the buffing side of things as well, um, instead of uh, purely on the defensive side. And uh, Druid, of course, uh, is the class with the best curve, so that definitely fits into the buffing mentality as well. Um, so this is all, it, it's all very good for the flexibility of the druid and to emphasize this one side um, of the druid. Uh, common card, good card, I like what I see. So uh, the other card that was released is a rare card, and we'll, we'll talk about rare cards after this, and you'll hear me say something like, one of the two rare cards released is Undercity Huckster. Uh, that's, I mean, from past Advokta. Future Advokta is here to tell you that Shadowward Fear is now a third rare card that has been revealed for Whispers of the Old Gods, and it is a priest card. It is, oh, it's a shadow word, of course it's a priest card. It is four mana, destroy all minions with two or less attack. First thing that comes to mind, Consecration, right? Which is basically destroy all minions with two or less health on your opponent's side. So step one, on your side of the board, you can't have any minions with two attack or less, or else this is worse. Step two, even if the opponent's minion isn't two, uh, two health or less, you still damage them, right? You can remove a Divine Shield, you can just you know add some damage or whatever, and you can't do that with Shadow Word Fear. So Shadow Word Fear is not as good as a Consecration. Um, but that's okay. Consecration is a super premium card, right? Even if you're not as good as a Consecration, you're still okay. You are, as a priest, probably not going to have that many minions with two or less attack hanging around on the board anyway. And if you just remove, like, I know a lot of people are down on this card, but if you just remove, like, two of your opponent's minions, right? Like a 2-3 and then, like, something else, you're doing okay. Priests really like mass removals. They like them because they're trying to play a defensive game, or they're trying to play a board game, but they fail a lot because they don't really have good cards that help them establish the board. So they're forced to play a defensive game and try to get back on the board. And a lot of that is being able to force your opponents into unfavorable trades into your minions. Your opponents don't want your minions to stay on the board because then you buff them and heal them, so they have to remove your minions. If your opponents are like running out of removals and can't like figure out the configuration on the board to get the optimal damage onto your high defense minions that your uh, high health minions that you're putting on the board, then they slowly just kind of run out of cards, right? And you can heal yourself too. So it's not like they can even smirk you that well. Um, and so in the end, this really fits that strategy because the worst thing for the priest is you see an opponent's board, they have a bunch of small stuff so they can always get the optimal trading on the board or they can just go for your face um, and get like a lot of damage and you can't remove them. So. Not as good as Excavated Evil or Holy Nova, uh, for that matter, obviously because you don't get rid of as many things, but also very good. Excavated Evil is a premium rank card, uh, Holy Nova is a premium rank card, Shadow or Fear, maybe not premium rank, but it's still going to be a good card. Uh, and sometimes you'll get value out of this card if you just kill like one Gurubashi or, or one um, Oasis Snapjaw or, or something, right? Like. 
you don't even have to remove two things with this card. It's it, the all minions with two or less attack. It's a little deceiving because you can trade away those minions uh, before you play it. So uh, I think it's it's in general an okay to good card. It, it fits what the priest needs. I think that's the important part, right? It fits the flavor of the priest where it's about attack and not defense, and it fits what the priest needs, which is mass removals. I've talked about this uh, before on the Light Forge, which is that I think a lot of these more defensive classes need more mass removals or just multi removals because they're they're missing that. And that makes them play, if you're missing mass removals and you're playing a defensive game, you're playing card for card, and that doesn't quite work because you're just kind of falling more and more behind. You need those double removals, those triple removals, in order to claim that card advantage game. Um, and this does it. it. It fits the bill. And so I think it'll really fit with what the priest wants to do. And so that's, uh, that's why I, I'm not as down on it as I think uh, a lot of people are. And now we give this back to Adbukta in the past, who has no idea that Shadow Word Fear and Mark of Yasser, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that card, exist yet, um, and who uh, apparently has, has better vision uh, than I do. Um, all the difference a day makes. Uh, one is the Undercity Huckster, which is a 2-mana two 2-2, two -two, Death Rattle, add a random class card to your hand. It's a rogue card. Rogues generally try to go faster, and uh, especially in the LOE, they added a whole bunch of cards like um, Cut Purse and uh, Tomb Pillager that add coins, which is even more tempo. And in TGT, they added like Pit Snake and like, you know, Buccaneer, these small cards, uh, Undercity Valiant, which has an extra damage that kind of like get you tempo. Undercity Huckster doesn't, it's purely anti tempo. It, you can either look at it as a better version of Loot Hoarder. Uh, which is which is great um, because it it can't be hero powered down and has one extra health, or you can look at it as a worse version of loot hoarder because the cards you get is random, uh, which is worse than whatever cards you have in your hand pro uh, in your deck probably. So cuts both ways. Um, I would think it's a little better because I value the fact that it can't be pinged a lot higher than the card that you get out of it. Uh, but regardless, it's not something that's going to help the row push the tempo. It's going to be like more of a combo trigger, right? Like, you can play this card and then play a combo fairly early in the game and this card won't lose you your card advantage. And it's a pretty decent body. Like, it'll hit something for two damage. Uh, so, good card. Good card, because loot, or loot order is a good card. But, you know, nothing to write home about. And it pushes the rogue, like, a little towards the slower side. Which is good, because the rogue have been, you know, being pushed a little, a little to the fast side. Um, and a lot of the power of the rogue lies in the fast side. So balancing it is, is good. And this is still very flavorful for the rogue, right? Like one of the things I hate is adding cards that kill the flavor, like Keeper of Oldemon. Paladins can't deal with big things very well, at least not their health. They can make big things like neutralize them by making them only have one attack, but they can't like, they can't like equality aside, right? Like you can do equality stuff or you can do humility stuff. Now you get a Keeper of Oldemon and you can just like cut big minis down to, I don't know. Like, it's better than just, like, a hard removal, sure, more flavorful than that, but still, it, it, it messes with what your expectations are playing against a Paladin. And, it, and when you do that, it kind of reduces the skill level in the game. Um, and Undercity Huckster, on the other hand, is still flavorful for the Rogue. Uh, adding random opponent's class cards to your hand is, is one of the Rogue's things now with Burgle. Uh, rogues have always been a card-drawing class with Sprint and Shiv and whatever, and so, you know, it fits. And then, Infest is our other rare card. Not much to say about it. It's a rare hunter card. Three mana, give your minions death rattle, add a random beast to your hand. Affectionately known as Unleash the Web Spinners, because you play it with Unleash the Hounds, and your Unleash the Hounds also give you back beasts. Random beasts are not that great. So for three mana, you don't want two of them, you want at least three of them. So you need at least three minions on the board, which is possible, especially if you're rogue, right? Especially if you can unleash. Um, but still, you know, Ball of Spiders is good, but not that great. Ball of Spiders is way more consistent. And so this card is going to be okay-ish, right? You don't really want to be drawing cards as the hunter. Um, it's not bad. It's certainly good value, like well-valued. But it just kind of doesn't fit into the hunter's game plan. Which again, I think is Blizzard's point. Um, except in the arena, there's no problem with like hunters smorking everyone down. Uh, generally, hunters kind of need a hand, and this card isn't doing it. Uh, but that's fine. It's a playable rare card. 
uh, the common cards could could all be a lot nicer for the hunter. Yeah, so that's that's uh, about the class balance. The uh, the complete unknowns, which is the next topic, and I've already covered it. it. That's what's going to matter, right? Three commons for each class, three rares for each class. That's what's going to determine uh, the class balance. And I'm really excited to see what they are because we haven't seen what they are. And looking at the, the class cards are always the more interesting cards than commons. Uh, but looking at the ones they've released so far, they're all very creative and they all go in directions that I like. Um, infest aside. And I guess we'll, we'll finish this off with the three cards that I couldn't quite fit into a category. Uh, but I do want to cover because I don't want to cover it later. Uh, one is Giant Sandworm. Once again, Hunter, late game-ish oriented card. Slow card. 8 mana, 8-8. Eight, eight. Not bad. Can't remove all the minions on the board if your opponent leaves it alone. Pretty good. Um, but it is a beast. Still good. Uh, buffs Ram Wrangler. Uh, very nice, but it's it's a big slow card, right? Like if you're the rogue, you generally don't want a big slow card. So it's a good card for what it does, but it's only going to be okay because it's in Hunter, and this is not what Hunters want. So next is let's do Doom. This card I really like. I really, 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 really like this card. Um, if Whatever that Paladin card is, I need to memorize the names of, of cards that I really like. Stand Against Darkness. If Stand Against Darkness is my favorite card because of what it does for the arena meta, then Doom is my favorite card because of the flavor. Doom is 10 mana. Destroy all minions. Draw a card for each. It's an epic Warlock card. So it doubles up on uh, Twisting Nether, which is great. Because Warlocks have large, equally both sides destruction spells. That's what they do. And they don't have enough of it to really make it a theme. And they kind of need it to be a theme. Because they don't really have hard removals. Um, they have Siphon Soul. And that's kind of it. And so Doom and Twisting Nether. Twisting Nether, by the way, is rated like okay. Because it's like slow and clunky. But it does do something Warlock can't do otherwise. You remove large things from the board. So your opponent gets a board, you remove it, they have to replenish it. And sure, they could replenish it, but they could also just be out of large things. And then you're fine, because you have small things. Uh, and Doom is just flat out better than Twisting Nether. Because unless you have to use it before turn 10, you'd rather pay 2 mana and get like 2-3 more cards. Otherwise, you have to like trade health for the cards. Which, if you're using this card, you're already behind, and you're already probably hurting for health. So this is actually like, the drawing cards part is actually kind of important even for the Warlock. But I just like the flavor of it. It's a good direction uh, for the Warlock, and it's something that the Warlock needs. This is like the opposite of Keeper of Ultimon. Um, okay, and then finally, Renounce Darkness. Uh, everyone is in love with the card design. It's two mana. Replace Warlock Epic. Replace your Warlock power, Hero Power and Warlock cards with another classes. The cards cost one mana less. It's basically gang up. Except you can save Warlock cards in your hand, and then you can play them instantly for, uh, one, better cards, probably, because Warlock class cards are not that good. And two, for one less mana, which is kind of good. Uh, you could potentially make up for the two mana you lose here. But regardless, you're down a card. Uh, and yeah, as the Warlock, you don't care that much about cards, but you, you no longer have the Warlock hero power after you use it. So... You have to like draw a lot of cards as the Warlock and then flip them all and then use some cards in the same time in order to like keep up the tempo. But you're behind on the tempo already because you've had to like draw a lot of cards already. And then you have another hero power. What's it going to do? What are you going to take the warrior hero power um, like to, to heal up again? Because I, I just don't know what you do with it. Um, and regardless, you lose a card. That's such a big disadvantage. You lose a card, you probably lose tempo, and you throw a lot of RNG into the game. So, like, it's going to be better than Gang Up, sure. But Gang Up is so bad. I think we have it in the single digits or something. Like, this is not a playable card in the arena, uh, except to get on Troden. So there is a use for it. Um, all right, 
well, uh, that went on longer than I intended, but I think I should just expect that. And uh, this is all we have for today. We'll go more in depth about game design and Cthune uh, on either the next video or the video after that uh, when we get a, a smaller batch. But I just wanted to cover all the cards that we have so far. So we're all kind of on the same page when it comes to the arena meta. Um, if you have any comments, if you think, you know, I'd booked it, you're crazy. What do you mean the forbidden cards are, you know, as good as a, a Cabal Shadow Priest? They're like Dark Iron Dwarf at best. Um, Feel free to comment on the bottom. I read all the comments, uh, even if I don't respond. And uh, I'm interested in what in what other people have to say about this. I, I've reviewed all these cards, by the way, without looking at what any other arena player's um, review of these cards are, uh, just to make sure it's a fresh perspective. Um, and these are just my reviews. Um, Murps, the the other half of the Grinning Goat. It, he may have differing opinions and we generally talk each other through and then we end up sort of on the same page on most things um, but sometimes we end up on different pages like the kraken uh which was uh which i i still uh enjoy that that discussion with the kraken back in tgt because that's that's meta defining for that meta um and it's something that that you really needed to get right if you want to properly anticipate the tgt meta um, and I don't know what that card is for this expansion, but I can tell you, we haven't seen it yet. Because all the commons are not, like, super amazing tier. They're not going to have that effect on uh, on the meta. It will just slow the meta down a bit. Um, and so we're waiting. Uh, so once again, thank you everybody for watching. Comment below. Uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, our Patreons. Um, we are supported entirely by our fans um, at patreon.com or slash grinning goat. Uh, link uh, is somewhere here, probably. <laughs> and at least in the description, if you would like to contribute. And um, also, um, if you want to hear more about this, you can just wait for the next video. Or if you are anxious to just hear more arena discussion on these new and exciting um, Whispers of the Old God cards, you can listen to the Light Forge, which is our podcast. And you can search Light Forge on your iTunes, or you can Google it, or you can watch the YouTube videos, which we upload all the time. And uh, we'll be discussing cards as they come out here and there, the cards that we like uh, on the Light Forge, which comes out weekly on, uh, on Mondays. Um, and that has Murps in it, so you can get his opinion live on the spot. Um, so that's it. That's it for me. I uh, hope you guys tune in for the next card review as well. And um, I, I'm like, the cards revealed so far are not terribly exciting for the arena, but I am excited about this expansion. Because like I said, Blizzard can do so much with this expansion. And LOE has shown that they're doing stuff kind of with arena in mind now. Like it may not be the primary consideration for most of the cards, but they're, they're putting a thumb on the scale now instead of just letting the chips fall where they may. They're thinking about it. And so, you know, I'm, I, I feel good about Stand Against Darkness. I feel good about Nagatha's first, Nazatha's first mate. And I think there could be some really interesting things to come for the arena, uh, even in this constructed focused um, expansion. And hey, just more cards, new meta, right? We've been in this meta for like four months now. Um, that's it for me. See you guys next time.